Anyway, thank you for coming to the class, especially despite the weather. Um, my name's Alex Pitstowski, so for those of you that haven't met me yet, hi, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about some camera stuff. Oh, especially with a non-working remote, this is, this is starting off perfectly. Yep, there we go. Okay, so who here likes taking pictures? Everybody? We all good on that? Okay, good. So we're all in the right place then. So what this class mainly is, is it's, it's going to dive into some of the more details on how these things work, what settings affect what, and just some basic tips and, and photo things that are a little bit more than how to take your camera off the green auto mode and put it anywhere else. This is the next class, the one that goes after that. So let me see if I can get this remote working for all of two seconds. And since I can't, I'm going to be standing right here. All right, so. One of the th best things about DSLRs, of course, is that you can photograph really just about every possible subject matter with them. I mean, everything from macro like back here to astronomy. By the way, does anybody know what fisheye lenses originally were designed for? Particularly, maybe a hint. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually more for uh, meteorology and things that you could see the entire sky in one shot because you're seeing from horizon to horizon. That top line up there is the one horizon, the other one down there is the other. So if you really do want to get the entire sky in a single frame, a fisheye is actually your best bet for doing so. And if you notice, it's not horrendously distorted in that case. But you get the idea. DSLRs let you shoot whatever you want to shoot extremely well. The best image quality generally until you hit medium format. Um, any, I know this is a re repeated one definitely. Um, any idea what this is for for example, I get star trails a lot. I'm sure those of you that have seen this a few times probably have heard that one before. No, this is this is a CD, exactly. This is a, a CD with a single flash lighting low and off the side. Um, but point being here, basically, if you have light and you can bring light with you with flashes, then you have the ability to take a picture, and probably a pretty good one at that if you're creative about it. I'm not saying, by the way, that I am the world's most creative person. You're going to see like maybe a hundred of my shots. I've taken more than a hundred shots. Just bear that in mind. <laughs> Stuff like this even. <laughs> you get the point. So let's start with one of the basic things, the basics of format. Now, DX versus FX are the two different formats of DSLRs that we make. And they're primarily different in a very simple way. But what that turns into can get complicated for kind of ridiculous reasons. I'll explain as I go. So DX is the smaller of the two formats. And that's the size of the camera sensor. And so the bigger that is, generally the better that the image quality gets, or the better the light performance becomes. Think solar panels. The bigger the solar panel, the easier uh, time it has receiving all the energy from the light. So the DX sensor here, of course, can easily be covered by the DX image circle. That's any lens that says DX on it will produce an image circle just like that. Not a problem at all on a DX sensor, but on a full frame sensor you vignette, which is where you get very dark corners. Now, some DX lenses can get fairly close to the edges, but none of them really cover a full frame. So for any time that you're shooting a full frame camera, I, highly, I would highly recommend having a full frame lens on the camera. Otherwise, you're not making the best use of your, your resolution. A 36 megapixel D810, for example, goes down to about 15 megapixels. A 24 meg uh, D750 hits about 10. So really, you do see a substantial drop in resolution if you put a DX lens on an FX camera. But you can physically do this. If you're shooting video, by the way, it doesn't matter as much. As in, you can still get the same frame rate and resolution in DX as you can in FX on a full frame camera in most cases. It's, uh, but for full uh, stills, when you have a full frame sensor, I'd recommend a full frame lens. But that's sort of, I think, the obvious. The less so obvious is what it actually does to focal length and distortion. Now, very often you hear things, oh, I keep forgetting the remote's not working. <laughs> and very often you hear things about, you know, it turns one lens into another lens. What it's all, all it's really doing is cropping. So full frame, versus DX, which is about like that. But here's where this becomes extremely relevant. If you've ever been told that you can get away with a 50 millimeter lens on a DX body as a portrait lens because it becomes a 75, First of all, it doesn't. <laughs> so there's that right off the bat. What it's doing, though, is its field of view, the angle at which it sees, becomes equivalent to a 75 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. However, its focal length stays at 50 in that case. It stays exactly the same. So take the case where you have a 35 millimeter full frame lens and a 35 millimeter DX lens. They're both physically 35 millimeters, as in 35 millimeters from the optical center to the focal plane. That's the center or the film, whichever you're using. So they're both physically 35 millimeter lenses. But do you see how the angle is restricted here versus fanned a bit there? That's what you're going to see as the conversion factor, essentially. That this is only designed to project onto a smaller format, where this is designed to hit a much bigger one. So even though they're both the same focal length, they're designed for different sensors. Now, if you put this lens on there, what would it look like? 
Okay, that's perfect, because it wouldn't look any different. <laughs> so I'm glad none of you had a ton of answers for how it would look different, because that would have been, that would have been bad news. Um, but basically, yeah, a 35 millimeter full frame lens on a DX camera would look exactly the same as the 35 mm DX lens would. It might be even a little bit better, because you're just shooting the center of the lens at that point. But either way, it's still going to be a 35 mm lens. But on a DX camera, because it crops down, oops, just like that, the field of view, the angle of view rather, will become equivalent to that of a 50 millimeter lens on full frame. So the only thing here that's becoming equivalent is the angle that the lens actually sees at. The other things that don't become equivalent when you change format would be things like depth of field and actual distortion. So the way your lens has always handled on full frame is the same way it would handle on DX, except that now you're just seeing a narrower angle of it. So, important things. For example, if you're shooting portraits, you might shoot a 50, on, a 50 instead of an 85 if you have a DX camera. Now granted, the 85 millimeter lens might cause you to have to, say, you know, bust a hole in a wall so you can shoot far enough away from your subject to get the framing you want. If that's, your, if that's the handicap, then understandably you probably need to go with a shorter focal length lens or a full frame camera. But what I wanted to show you is the relatively subtle difference between these two shots. And I apologize for those of you that have been to this class before and seen all this before, but it still is a good, good lesson to know, which is that this one here was basically taken, it was, from what I understand, taken on a DX body with a 50 millimeter lens against this one here, taken on a full frame body with an 85. Now the angle of view is extremely similar, which means that you're standing about as far away from the person for both shots. But of course the main difference here is one's a 50, which introduces more distortion than the 85 does, which is that one. So do you see what I'm talking about here? Their depth of field also would be affected whether you shoot full frame or DX. And here's basically how. Let's say you shot an 85 millimeter lens on both, both a full frame and a DX format camera. Now, if you were standing 15 feet away on the DX model, you might be standing 10 feet away on the full frame, because that way you get the same angle, you get the same shot. But the difference is that on the full frame camera, because you're physically standing closer, you're focused farther from infinity. You're focused closer to the minimum focus range. Because of that, the background will naturally be blurrier than it would on the DX model, where you have to stand farther away. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, head nods are totally acceptable. I'm okay with that. All right. So yeah, that's that's one of the other big things. If you if you work a lot with people, the picking a format like FX can be a major advantage because you'll have a blurrier background and less distortion for a given focal uh, for a given field of view. If you go DX, you have the advantage for distance and uh, sometimes for speed as well. So if you're doing birding, for example, I would highly recommend to use something like a D500 instead of maybe a D5. Even though both cameras would do extremely well for birding, birding particularly, where there's no such thing as a lens that's quite long enough, that DX 1.5 really does help. It'll give you that extra bit of reach and you won't lose any light getting there. And in this case, you're at the same resolution on those two different models just about. Now, the next thing is how the camera's made. Is this thing going to fall apart as soon as water touches it? Or can I actually shoot this thing like it's, you know, like there's no tomorrow? Generally, if it's a full frame body or if it's a full metal body, you can shoot it like there's almost no tomorrow. Almost. Big caveat, tiny word. Um, what I'm talking about here is that if you were to shoot, like, for example, all these yellow lines here are weather seals in the camera. So what's going on here is that if water's landing on it from rain, from, you know, anything from the sky, basically, Basically, it's not going to be a big deal. The weather seals prevent the water from getting into the internals of the camera where it can do any damage. But there's a big difference between weather sealed and waterproof. And waterproof, these are not. Weather sealed, some of them are. But here's a, a good case study. So this is my friend Seth. This is us out in Iceland years ago, I think back in uh, 2010. And the two of us basically lived out of a car for a week and a half in March in Iceland. And it was an amazing thing to do. You learn a lot of stuff about landscape photography when you never leave the landscape you're in. But at the same time, I be careful. If you go out there and do that, be careful. Um, for things like this, for example, because he's already passed the don't go past this rope rope, and my foot is hooked around part of it going out farther still so I could get this shot. So I'm not saying, you know, risks don't happen out there, but point being the camera shouldn't be the thing, it shouldn't be the main concern. Most of your concern in this case should be not falling off this cliff into the few hundred feet down. But I'm not worried about the camera touching snow and immediately shutting down or anything crazy. So part of this is because the camera and lens are fully weather sealed. I know the build of this gear pretty well because I've abused it more than most people should. Um, and here's a case in point. So for those of you that have seen this, I apologize for the repetition, but this is, as you can all tell, a geyser. Now this is the only geyser I've ever seen in person in my life, and so you can bet I was going to stay there and photograph this thing until we got something we're relatively happy with. A totally different thing happened, which was equally entertaining, and I get to use it now. So as you can see all the people on that side, the smart people over there, now you see all the water puddles here. 
guess what's happening next? So I get a few of these shots and I get out of the way. Now he got a few of those shots and didn't get out of the way. So that means that the water, the, the 30 or so foot tower of boiling water lands on him, the D700, and it was a, I think a 20 to 70 at the time. So all of that, including him, were fine. He was fully insulated. He had, you know, uh, Arctic gear on, so it had the toe covered. So he was okay against the heat. The camera, though, I'm amazed at because as you can see, there's snow on the ground. So it's going from very cold to very hot and tons of water. There's nothing in any manual anywhere that I've ever seen that says a camera should survive this. And believe me, I am not up here to tell you it would do it twice. I would never make that bet again. But because it happened and survived, I can tell you that I've been very impressed with how weather sealed these things actually are. That basically walking around in a light rain with a fully weather sealed camera body and lens does not even register anymore as something that I should be thinking about or concerned about. Unless I've got raindrops getting on the front element of my lens and screwing up my shot. That's about it. Um, now if you're shooting a 5000 or 3000 series DSLR body, those are not weather sealed. So in that case, light rain should definitely cause you to stop and think and get an umbrella. Um, but a 7000 series and up, generally from there on, are at least partially weather sealed. Um, so from there on, you should be in relatively good shape. But be aware, it is an expensive line to cross if you cross it and you have no idea where that line is until you cross it. So be careful out there. Um, but they can generally take a little more abuse than you might expect. By the way, the difference being, of course, it falling into water, it would be destroyed. So the, a colleague of mine once dropped a 1424 in a river, and as he puts it, then I saw bubbles coming out. If you see bubbles coming out, it's going to be an expensive and very bad day. <laughs> so, does everybody understand where we're at so far? As far as these things are really neat, you can really shoot them in just about every kind of situation, even crazy ones like this. And now, granted, it's not raining here, but I am hanging out of the back of a moving car at about 40 or so miles an hour, photographing this Lotus. Now, VR modes come into play here because, as you can see with the motion blur, we're either going extremely fast or I'm doing something at relatively low shutter speeds. In this case, it's not quite the extremely fast, but fast enough and low shutter speeds. There's two modes that a lot of our lenses have that have VR, and I see a lot of people use them incorrectly, so that's why. I like to always try to figure out you know why, but also make sure all of you understand what the modes are for. Now, the two modes in question here will be normal and active. Normal mode is where you should be the vast majority of the time. Normal is for normal photography, as in, if you're standing there and the camera's in your hand and you're on planet Earth, you're probably okay and normal. It's only if you're in a vehicle that is in motion that active becomes relevant. As in, in normal, what it's looking to fix would be high frequency, low magnitude vibrations. So your pulse, your breathing, a lot of little things that happen all the time. How However, active is only really looking for high magnitude and low frequency. So imagine, you know, a boat hitting waves or a plane hitting turbulence or a car hitting bumps. You've got big movements that don't happen as often. Now, the two of those don't really overlap much, if at all. So what ends up happening is if you set your camera to active VR, or rather your lens set to active VR mode, as you're shooting it standing there, your VR is almost turned off because all it's looking for are the really big ones. Now, let's say you go to pan. That's a really big one. It's going to try to counter that first before it realizes, oh, you're panning and shuts off panning, uh, shuts off VR in that direction. Our lenses, by the way, when the VR is turned on, can still pan in any orientation or direction. They automatically figure that out. But if you go with active mode and you think that's a better panning mode, you're incorrect because active will fight that initial larger movement before it basically realizes what you're doing. So shoot almost everything you shoot in normal mode. Active should only be used when you're on a moving platform, like a vehicle would be the, the basic way to do that. Or if there's an earthquake. If there's an earthquake and you're taking pictures, active mode probably is going to help stabilize stuff. So just throwing that out there. Um, the other thing is I only turn VR off when I've met a couple of conditions or when I'm doing very long exposures. Because if you just have the camera on a tripod, it's stable-ish. It's not normally totally, totally stable. Now, if you don't believe me, go to live view and zoom in all the way and see how stable your camera actually is on your tripod. It can be really jarring when you realize that you can see movements from yourself standing next to it if you're on like an old wooden floor. The muscle movements in your legs keeping you up can actually cause the camera to blur slightly in some configurations. Um, but what I found is that if you have the ability to turn the mirror, uh, let's say you set the camera to mirror lockup mode, use a cable release, you have the camera on a good stable tripod, no wind, and you know not on soggy ground, then I might turn VR off because I've already manually eliminated every possible vibration I can think of. Now, if you have the camera shooting longer than maybe eight seconds or so, general long exposure night photography stuff, I would also turn VR off for those because by over time, this thing will average out. If there's gusty winds or anything like that, then I might leave it back on again. But generally, I leave VR on almost all the time, including when I'm on a tripod, especially if I'm touching the camera. It's only, like I said, if I've completely isolated myself from the camera that I can actually afford to turn off VR. Otherwise, it really does help with everything. 
All right, so next few things. There's motion blur and then there's focus blur. And it's important to be able to distinguish which is which because if you make the wrong call here, you're not going to be able to improve your photography sharpness one way or the other. Now, focus blur is, I'm sure, something you're all fairly familiar with. That's what we've got here. Now, that's obviously something sharp, something blurry. But the important part is that the blur is uniform. As in the blur, if you have a tiny point, it just gets bigger. It doesn't go to one direction or the other. Whereas this, of course, is motion blur. Hopefully not in the car, but on the background. Motion blur always picks a direction. They can pick multiple directions. You can have, I mean, if you don't believe me, try to do a two-second handheld shot of Christmas lights. You'll find blur can have every direction that, that there is. Um, but the important thing is that you notice whether it's focus or motion blur. And very often when it's minor, it can be hard for people to tell. The best way I find to figure this out is to really look at a single tiny point source of light and to figure out has that just gotten bigger or has that gotten smeared any. If it's smeared, it's motion blur and you need a higher shutter speed or more stability to fix your problem. If it's focus blur, then you've got a different problem to solve. Then you've got to figure out why that shot was out of focus. And it can be everything from the wrong focus mode to, you know, the, just some other manual thing that happens. Um, but generally, it's important to figure this out because if you don't, you won't be able to improve. One of the other imp important things, though, to watch for is that if you have a lens producing distortion like this, where it's very uneven from one end to the other. Sometimes that can be caused by either a drop or something that affects the lens physically, something that misaligns things within a lens. So be careful. If you see a very, very unusual aberration to a lens that, say, has been sitting in a bag for a long time and that bag's had stuff piled up on it, it's not, it's, it is certainly possible that something in there could be damaged and could move. You'll typically will also feel this when you, have, when you go to zoom the lens. You'll feel a difference in how tight the ring is in certain points. But anyway, if you have to get blur, as in if focus blur is not your problem but motion blur is. In this shot, for example, I was shooting a D70 back in college, and the D70, as good a camera as it was, was not the world's best low-light camera. It was very good at the time, but even then, it was really about where film was at, if not a little a little less, maybe. Um, but shooting at 400 ISO was about the highest I could shoot before I got an unacceptable level of noise to what I wanted there. And I'm shooting an old 70 to 300 non-VR, so I'm, I'm weaving myself through the stands here to try to get a stable position to hand shoot this thing for the paper. So what I've realized at that point was I could either keep stationary and get the field nice and sharp and the players blurry, which did me absolutely no good. Or for those of you that have ever done indoor sports or anything where you have to photograph the people doing stuff at high speed in low light, if you need to get blur, and blur is your only option, you can at least make blur happen in places that you don't mind. For example, panning, a technique like this. If you move with your subjects, if you can keep your subjects stationary in the viewfinder, they'll be sharper, of course, than the background, which is moving. Now, the way that I find is best to do this is if you're standing, the right way is keep your upper body fairly stable. You want to keep your arms tucked in, hold everything like this. I would not recommend live view where you're out here. That's just going to make things bouncy. But bring it all in and turn at your waist. If you can turn at your waist, all of this stays stationary and stable, and it will help you get a sharper pan. But the other th uh, thing would be the aim small, miss small axiom. That if, you, if you're just trying to get your focus point on a particular player, that's already pretty good. But if you're trying to get the very corner of that focus point on a particular part of the player's uniform, for example, well, now you're looking more finely. You're looking at a smaller target. And I find that really does improve your pans when you can look that much more specifically. If you're just looking at box on player, that can move this much. And if it does that, then you'll have blur. But if it's just this tiny part of the focus point or this tiny part of your viewfinder aligned with a tiny part of what you want to keep stationary, that specificity can really help improve your pans. By the way, shoot continuous high for this because you will not likely get every single one of those shots to look the way you want. It's very unusual to even get a handful that do. Um, panning is a technique to practice. Cars work fine for that. Little kids work fine for that. They run around plenty and don't seem to ever stop. Pets are good except for cats, which are amazingly vindictive for panning. They see you and they leave. Um, I've had cats my entire life, by the way. They're wonderful photo subjects because they will teach you to be basically bulletproof at anything else you're photographing. If you can get cats sharp consistently, especially in motion, you'll be fine on like a NASA rocket launch. It's, it's insane. Um, <laughs> so how do you actually get the sharpest shots out of all this? First thing, and second and third pretty much, tripod. If you can use a tripod, use a tripod. Tripods will do a few things for you. One is they'll slow you down which can be a good thing or a bad thing depending on what you're, what you're shooting. If you're working with stationary subjects, things like landscapes, which I know is debatable how stationary that is, um, but if you're working with subjects that aren't running around so much, the tripod's a really good thing that it slows you down. It'll help you focus more on composition, and it'll also help, of course, keep everything stable and open up the entire range of shutter speeds to you that you couldn't normally use. Now, if uh, you can't use a tripod, there are still plenty of other things you can do. 
by the way, the weirder your tripod is, the better it tends to work. For example, I have killed a good number of tripods that look a lot like that. And this isn't anything against any brand or anything like that. I have just destroyed enough of these tripods by misusing them because I needed them to do stuff like this. So what I mean by that is, let's say I needed my camera to get much lower than it could get, I would do something kind of like this, where I would extend just one leg, and then I'd lean on it, which would inevitably over time bend that leg, which would make that leg stiffer, loosen the whole thing up, and gradually destroy my tripod just so I could get the camera a couple inches lower. Now, a tripod, something like that, where, and again, not really a brand specific thing, but a camera, a tripod where you can take the center column out and arrange it in a different way, the less you get flat to the ground. So the weirder your tripod is, the cooler your angles get, because all of a sudden now you can do that three hour star trail photo from an inch off the ground with total stability. That gets to be a lot of fun. That and the ability to shoot straight down or do something weird like this. I mean, this whole shot here, the, the whole reason I almost poke a hole through my passenger seat in this, on this day was to basically have this pushed up against the windshield so I could do a time lapse of the car driving up Mount Washington. So that kind of thing really, it's, it, I never thought I'd need a more expensive tripod. I thought I could keep getting there with the cheaper clearance bin ones that you saw in the previous shot. But really, the better tripod is, the easier it is to use, the better, uh, the better it works for you, the more it can do. And ultimately, I've not killed this tripod, and I've had this for about five years now. Where all of the other ones I just use as old light stands and stuff where stability isn't that critical anymore. Basically, any tripod that works for you is a good one. Oh, and the, the classic thing with tripods, of course, is you can have stable, light, and inexpensive. Pick any two. So yeah, think that one over. Anyway, so the other thing, of course, because not everything is going to be tripod based, and a lot of things, sports, birding, things like that, tripods would be somewhat prohibitive. They might slow you down too much. So I would at least recommend shooting on continuous mode. Personally, I'd recommend continuous high. Continuous high is the fastest frame rate your camera can handle. We have cameras, you know, the 3,000 to 5,000 start uh, go up to five frames per second, and every camera after that goes faster. So uh, if you go all the way up to a D5, you're looking at 12 frames per second if you're tracking. If you're not focused tracking, you can hit 14. So one of the best ways to, oh, what I meant, uh, the other thing I meant to get to on this, when you shoot continuous, let's say you have a shutter speed range that's a little bit low. Maybe you're shooting a 15th of a second on a relatively longer lens that you don't want to be shooting. So if you know that you're 50 50 chance, uh, that you've got a 50 50 chance of getting a sharp shot, it behooves you to take several shots. You're very likely to have one of those be sharp. But if you only take one frame at a time, every time you take a frame, you're moving the camera. And because of that, you're likely to impart some blur. But if you hold the shutter down and take two or three frames, your first one is usually the least sharp of those because it's the one where you move to activate the camera. After after that, though, you haven't moved in relationship to the camera anymore as it continues firing. Because of that, those uh, successive frames are very often sharper than the previous one was. So, continuous is a very good move. It's digital. You don't have to take your camera apart every 24, 36 shots. It's worth it to do it, in my opinion. Uh, let me see if I can get that fun new thing out of there. I don't know what's going on with that. And back to play. Okay. So, the other thing, of course, is isolating vibrations with things like mirror lockup. Now, a tripod is required, realistically, for mirror lockup to make any sense because the vibration from the mirror is so minute that you don't normally see its effect unless every other possible thing has already been accomplished. So, if you have the camera stable and it's on a tripod and it's got a cable release and, you know, there's no wind and all that stuff, if you're shooting between a 15th of a second, uh, I'm sorry, about a 30th of a second and a half second, is roughly the range where mirror slap can can cause the most problems from what I've read and from what I've experienced as well. So if you already have your camera very stable, locked down, everything is, is fine, you can usually increase its sharpness slightly in those ranges especially by using mirror lockup. But here's an important thing to know about this. You have to fire the camera twice to take a picture. As in the first time you fire it, it locks the mirror. The second time you fire it, it actually activates the shutter and takes a picture. This means that if you're waiting to do a long exposure, and this has happened before to me, where you fire the camera thinking you've started your exposure and then you sit they're waiting and imagining how great this exposure is going to look and all the great things it's going to do for you and then you hit it again or rather you undo it and nothing changes and so you hit it again you hear it click but no image comes up it's because after that you know however many minutes of waiting you've just started your exposure not ended it so make sure you hit the shutter twice and if you're doing this with your finger not with a uh, cable release of some kind don't even worry about mirror lockup you're going to introduce more blur by touching the camera than mirror lockup would even care about so at that point you've got to go back to more square one but to get a shot like this, this is what I'm talking about, how to get things this ridiculously sharp. I'm not saying just this, but you'll see when I zoom in. This shot took a lot of effort to get. This was not an easy one, but it's one of the first ones I took with a very high-res camera. This was one of the first shots I took with an 800E, and this was with a 60 millimeter 2.8 macro at one-to-one. -one. So I'm focused as close as I can focus. In this case, too, I had that tripod aimed straight down. So I had that center column out like this, camera aimed straight down. Now the problem was that I'm on the second floor of a wooden floor of a friend's house, 
And we notice this is where I had the thing in live view. I zoomed all the way in. And I start noticing this really regular recurring pattern of blur, which I realized eventually is my pulse. Every time my heart beats, I could see it in the screen very slightly. Now, this is when you're down to just about the pixel level. But if you imagine a, a one and a half inch thing by one inch having 36 million dots on it, you don't have to move very much before you've crossed one or two of those dots. So these things become fairly apparent when you zoom way in on the, on the LCD screen. But anyway, point being, what I had to do is use a cable release that was wrapped around the tripod leg with a weight on it, a brick or something, and then stretched it across the room, did the same thing on the other end of the room, and sat down in order to get this shot. I would fire the camera once to initiate to lock the mirror, wait about 10 seconds, and then fire the camera again to take the shot. That's how I got the shot this sharp. As in, each one of these little things in here is roughly a pixel or so. But these things are also the tiny little teeth that make a record make sound. So if you've ever seen a record with that fine detail, you can appreciate just how small that is. Now, if you shoot a DX model, by the way, which actually has a higher pixel density, you'd be able to see that even a little bit closer. Because even though the macro lens would still be the same macro lens, you would see it with that crop already. So if you compare that resolution to what you'd get zoomed in on, on the full frame cameras, for macro, for truly one-to-one -one and beyond magnification, the DX bodies actually sometimes will get you closer. Well, actually, they will get you closer at a higher pixel density. The question about a mirror lockup of what's the optimal shutter speed range to use that in? For me, I'd say around a thirtieth of a second to a half second would be about the right range. That's still where the mirror lockup could be in effect enough to blur a shot, especially on longer lenses in certain cases. But it's not enough that the camera would even it out with a longer exposure, and it's also not so little that the camera would essentially just fire fast enough to not make it a not make it a problem. Yeah, I, I do. I prefer continuous high to uh, continuous low simply because it's faster. That is really the only reason. And on a D5 or something like that, that's where I might go to continuous low for like a mere 8 frames per second instead of the normal 12 on CH. But the reason I shoot CH so often is I'm typically shooting cameras like the D810, um, D750, so I'm usually shooting around 5 frames per second anyway. And what I like about this is that with CH, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to take the back of the camera off every 24 or 36 frames. So I can shoot pretty endlessly in those modes. Now to be fair, I'm, there still is buffer depth to worry about. I'm not shooting 40 frames on a D810 in a row at full speed, you know, to get the one I want. I'm usually shooting sets of two or three instead of a single shot in order to ensure that of those sets, I've got a single one in them that's sharp, if not multiple that sharp. Who here has ever done professional photography? Weddings, portraits, anything with people? Okay, anything in general professionally? Okay, so I've got a few. Um, it's one of those things I'm sure you can appreciate if you've ever had a professional photographer work for you at a wedding or anything like that, or if you've ever been on the other side of the camera there. You can't miss a shot, you know, and you will miss a shot. You will definitely miss a shot, and you'll do it all the time. But the trick is not missing the most critical shots, and especially if you do that, figuring out ways you can cover yourself. So shooting continuous high is one of the best ways, because that way, if you get that perfect shot, it's an entire group of 40 people, perfectly lit, sunset, I don't know, dolphin in the background, whatever it is. Like, first, you might not know the dolphin's coming. So shooting a few frames means that if it does jump during that set, you're more likely to get it than not. But also that if you if you get that shot perfect and the bride or groom is blinking, <laughs> then it's not perfect. Then it's not your fault at all, but it's not perfect. Then it could be improved. If you fired another frame a fifth of a second later, chances are one of them is not blinking anymore. And then if you really, really had to be crazy about this, you could Photoshop the eyes from one onto the other shot. I'm not recommending that necessarily, but my point being that for shots of people, especially in groups, you never know what you're going to get in any of this. But for those, you can get the perfect shot and have somebody in the group ruin the shot for you by what they're doing. So to fire multiple frames gives a m much greater buffer to what you're going to get and typically helps that out a lot. That way when I come back home I feel really assured that every shot that I need I have and usually multiple copies thereof. So the question was about reciprocity. As I suspect the likely uh, reciprocity failure in long exposures in film, where, which is where the colors would be rendered unevenly. They, you'd have to determine your exposure, but also know at what rate almost things would happen within the different color layers. Now, I haven't noticed this with digital. In film, I've noticed this, where there could be a color shift or something like that for a long exposure. But in digital, I've seen it seems to be fairly linear. Now, there might be an even more technical explanation out there that proves me slightly wrong, but at least in observable consequences of, of long exposures, I've not noticed any particular issue at all with digital, either rendering a color asymmetrically or shifting a color or anything quite like that. So digital really seems to be quite good at long exposure. The important thing is to make sure, though, that you don't, like, for example, if you're able to shoot a long exposure of a landscape in the winter, you'll have less noise than if you do so in the, in the heat of the summer. So that is one of those things that, that'll make a difference to your grain structure. So for example, when I was out in Iceland in, in the previous shots, one of the things that I brought with me for the D700 was the, I think it was an MBD-10, the battery 
grip for it. And what I did is I loaded that with lithium ion AA batteries because they're much less affected by the cold than the rechargeable batteries tend to be. And that way I could stay outside and get very long exposures on that camera. And even at relatively high ISOs because of how cold it was. And it stayed fairly noise free and got me the shot I wanted. So using the combination of cold and better batteries can also help a little bit for this for long exposures, particularly this time of year. So be wary out there. Most likely your batteries are gonna, are gonna shut your night down faster than any kind of reciprocity issue would. So the question was, what, what is, how much of the frame is the D750 using in video? It is using less of the frame inherently because it's gone from two-thirds format to 16 by 9 format. So you always lose the top and bottom a little bit. But does it use the full width of the frame or does it use the DX crop? And that I don't recall at the moment. I know that you can use the DX crop at its full resolution and full frame rate. I don't recall if it stays full frame for the overall video recording. Um, I'd have to look into that and I wouldn't want to tell you the wrong thing there. So I think so, but I, again, opinion, not fact. I'd want to double check. So, anyway, moving on. More ways to get things sharp. Exposure to LAMO. Let's say you forgot almost everything I just taught you. You know, hypothetically, because I know how crazy that would be. Um, if you go, let's say, here's what happened to me for this shot, for example. As I was out with, a, with my friend who just picked up this car, this is some years ago, and I had just happened to borrow a D3S, so it was already a really good day. We had a new car to play with, we had a new camera to play with, and so we went out shooting. Now, I didn't bring much gear with me because we went out during the day and I didn't expect us to stay out very late. But we did, we stayed out a lot later than we planned and I wanted to get some good shots of the car at night. Now, I didn't have a tripod, I didn't have a cable release, so I knew that I couldn't push the shutter on the camera and expect any kind of sharpness at all out of my shot. What I did do is I took my shoes off and put them across like this so I could lay the camera down without putting it directly on the ground so I could aim it a little bit. The way if I sneak, uh, snuck my shoes in closer to each other, I could aim the lens up. Burn them farther out, I could aim the lens down. This is the probably worst way to do a tripod when you don't have a tripod, but it's just the technique that I found works for me. So knowing that, I knew I could go to say self-timer mode, and self-timer mode would mean that I could fire the camera and 10 seconds later it would fire. But that wouldn't produce a mirror lockup result. And for the shutter speed ranges I was shooting, I thought it might make sense to do that. Now there is a mode in a lot of our cameras called exposure delay mode. And exposure delay is awesome because it employs basically mirror lockup automatically. And what I do is I set it to a three second delay. And it which is the maximum time allowed on those cameras. Now, what's neat about this is I could fire the camera, and as soon as you push the shutter down, you hear the mirror move, and you feel the mirror move. But then three seconds later, it fires the shutter and actually takes the picture. Because of that, you've essentially accomplished tripod, mirror lockup, and cable release without any of those things. Granted, those things will help, but this is, if you're in a pinch, a good way to get around it. So generally where you're going to find that is in the custom settings menu and it'll typically be under the uh, shooting menu, in, in this case D4. Um, on a lot of our cameras it actually stays D4, but it's called exposure delay mode and I typically t it turn it on for the maximum possible amount of time. Also pretty useful for macro and things like that where critical sharpness is obviously critical. If you don't have a cable release or you're worried that by, t by firing the cable release you'll have moved it a little bit, which will shake your shot enough to notice, then exposure delay mode comes back in as another good option. So, talking about macro, the fraction, this is where we get a little bit more technical. And this is one of my pet peeve issues because I've heard some teachers tell people that you should shoot everything at high apertures, high like f36 or f22 in order to get everything sharp. And I'm here to tell you exactly why you don't want to do that. Now, the higher you go on that f number, the aperture, the more depth of field you have. So, you know, f22, you're going to have more stuff in focus than you would at f8. And in macro, that's extremely critical because the closer you get to stuff, the shallower your depth of field becomes. So it becomes harder and harder to get everything in focus when shooting macro. Those of you that shoot macro already know exactly what I'm talking about, and those of you that haven't shot macro have not had the nervous breakdown about how ridiculous this gets and how fast. But I'll show you the best ways to get around this. So as you can see, this is a shot with a D810. Now what I'm already amazed with is the level of detail on this from that, because this is just a crop from that. So that, that's the kind of resolution our cameras already are producing. But what's neat about this is if you want that kind of sharpness with more depth of field, the answer is not really to go higher F number at least to a point, and I'm going to show you what that point looks like. So shooting both of these here, this is the same camera, same lens, same everything, except shutter speed and aperture. And the, if you notice though, way sharper, way less sharp. Now f11 is a pretty good normal aperture. You can shoot that safely on all of our cameras and really not get to fraction. But if you go all the way to f57, this is exactly focused the same spot that that is. They're in focus in the same way. That is obviously nowhere near as detailed as that. And the reason is something called diffraction. Diffraction happens when you stop a lens down 
fairly far. Um, I'd say anything past 16, you are starting to enter that territory. If you have a DX sensor, 24 meg sensor without an optical low pass filter, after 11, you might start to see it. By 16, you will generally see it. And the farther out you go, the worse it gets, 57 being the extreme end of this. Now, if you look at between FX and DX, here's something really cool to note, is that because you have higher pixel density on the DX model, even though this is the same lens, the shot's closer, as you can see. Now, what's neat about that is that means you can actually get higher detail levels in here. But the higher the detail you could get, the sooner diffraction is going to take it back from you. So if you notice at 5.6, they both get a little sharper. F8, they get a little sharper. F11, they're still getting sharper. So right now, you're seeing things that you can't see with the human eye. I mean, this is still literally the needle, of the, th the eye of a needle for thread, and that's thread, not rope. So you get what I'm saying for scale here, right? This is already pretty tiny. But notice the green structure and everything, because going from F11 to F16, you'll probably only see it if you're about as crazy as I am, which is a very slight drop in contrast here. So as you go from one to the other, you see a very slight drop off in contrast. It's only about a pixel or two wide. But that's, if you're going for maximum possible sharpness, like neurotic levels of sharpness, this matters. If you're not, then it doesn't matter until you're past 16. Because past 16, this gets worse. And as you can see, it starts to get worse here sooner than it gets worse there. Physics is the same to both cameras, but you've got smaller pixels on the DX model in this case. Because of that, you're gonna see diffraction a little bit earlier. So by 32, this is definitely noticeably blurred compared to that, even though they're same, same lens, same aperture. This is why, by the way, if you were shooting film or if you were shooting like a D700 or something like that, they had fairly, I mean, film obviously had no pixel density. It was its own thing. But the 700 had fairly low pixel density. So you could go to higher apertures before you'd see this effect. But it's just because you couldn't resolve the amount of detail that you'd lose from, uh, from diffraction. The only way around diffraction, by the way, is a technique called focus stacking. And it's one that I'll, I'll explain a little bit about now. Instead of taking one photo of something, you need to take a whole series of photos. And this is where being meticulous really pays. Because to get that shot, it completely sharp from edge to edge, you need a lot of photos. Usually, from my experience, if it's about a three inch depth, around 50 photos is about standard for me. Now, the way that that happens is that I'll basically set the lens wide open to see my minimum depth of field, focus on the nearest part of my subject on that, and then set it to around f11 or f13 for my maximum depth of field before diffraction robs me of sharpness. Take that photo. Then repeat, maybe a focused a millimeter in. I use the wide open to figure out where my next focal point will be, because that's my minimum depth of field, and I want to base all this on that. What happens is, after you take all of those shots, you combine them. So see how F8, we've got, obviously, you know, not a lot in focus, and what is is okay, but not amazing. If I go to 36, I've got all of it more in focus, but also all of it less sharp. So the conundrum there be, being what to do. Focus stacking, though, lets me shoot at F13 in this case, getting better sharpness on all of it, and getting all of it sharp in ways that even F36 or 57 would have had no chance at all of doing. Now, this is tedious. This would take me an hour easily to shoot each set for one photo, and about as long to edit most of the time. And as you can see, I actually missed a slice right here. 50 images, I got that one, that one, that one, that one, and missed this one. So do you see what I mean, how technical this can get? But if you want maximum sharpness, if you want to make photos that look like they're almost digitally rendered, that's one of the best techniques for doing it that I've ever found. And it can, if you have the time to do it, it can really bring a totally new aspect to your photography. So, other fun little tricks. Let's go opposite end of the spectrum. Let's say you're shooting sports, you're shooting something fast. A lot of our cameras have a virtual horizon built in now. So you're able to simply see in the viewfinder or on the LCD screen in the back when you're actually level. One of my favorite things to use this for though, even though it does work extremely well for action, I use it for landscape all the time. Which might have been the first thought you had, but the first time I used this was at a race. Now what was cool about this was I was shooting a D, either a D4 or 4S, and as I was tracking these cars, I was shooting AFC for continuous action, that's what helps you track movement, and I believe I was using 3D tracking, because my sub subjects were different colors than one another. 3D tracking seems to do really well when your subject's a different color than its background or the subjects around it. So shooting those kind of modes, as I was shooting continuous burst, I'm panning, so I'm keeping these arms nice and stable, but turning at my waist. And as I'm doing this, I'm kind of realizing I'm botching my pans, because when I get to about there, I started to lean. By the way, I had maybe three chiropractic visits in the last week. That's why I can do this now and not this now. You see what I mean? Yeah, if your back's all messed up like mine was for a while, I tended to pan and roll at the 
same time. And by doing that, I never was able to correct for it in the moment until this. And what I found was as I'm shooting like this, I'm watching that bar start to roll down the other end, which tells me I'm rolling the camera like that as I'm shooting. So I can correct it mid pan and continue shooting. So the Virtual Horizon is really clever. It can help out a lot. If you're shooting in low light conditions, like at night for landscape, you might not be able to see the horizon, but this can. This knows exactly when it's level. So if you keep that part level, you can still show people what you saw. I also use it sometimes if I'm ever on the side of a crazy steep mountain, I'll sh set the camera for level and take the picture and I can tell people reliably, yep, it was this steep, you know, that kind of thing. So Virtual Horizon is a really handy feature. And where it tends to be in the cameras is if you go into the custom settings menu and into, into controls, you can set a control to recall Virtual Horizon. So I typically will set uh, rather a function or the preview button to do something like this, where I'd hit the button and the Virtual Horizon would come up automatically. I don't like going through my menu for most things, only to set things to make them easier for me. And that's one of those ones to set. Custom settings, controls, and then you assign that control, whichever one you want, to that function. But it's really useful for a whole lot of things. Oh, I forgot architecture. Architecture is another really good one. If you've ever noticed how some architectural photographers just have this remarkable ability to keep buildings perfectly straight, and everybody else on Earth, they look like this, or they look like they're falling in at you, what's going on there is if you stay level and you take a photo of anything, especially if it's square, you'll see that it's square. As soon as you look up at keystones, when you look down at keystones the other direction. So what a lot of um, architectural photographers will do is they'll keep the camera level, and they'll shoot with what's called a tilt-shift lens, which is a lens that has these knobs and dials on it that allow you to shift the lens up and down and actually tilt it at a slight angle to shift where your focus is. But the cool thing is you can keep the camera level. You can shift the lens so that you see the part of the frame you want to see, see the upper part of the building. But because you've never done this, never leaned back with the camera, you've never keystoned the building. So the building stays perfectly square. Much easier to do when you know what level is. So either do a bubble level in the, view, in the um, hot shoe or use a built-in level like this. It'll make a big difference. Oh, I didn't realize I still had this in there. So yeah, where I was talking about before is custom settings in the menu. That's a little pencil icon right there. You go down to controls, and then you've got a couple options here. You could assign function, assign preview, you can assign a lot of stuff. Our custom settings, by the way, is exceptionally logical as menus go, as in where do you think you'd go in custom settings to modify controls? Might it be the one that says controls? You see what I mean? So that's the thing. All you have to do is read and you'll find these things. But anyway, I, in this case, assign a uh, function button and have it uh, viewfinder virtual horizon. And then you've got, on a lot of our cameras, make sure you hit the OK button, the one that says OK on it, not the center button. Center button can work really well, like 80% of the time. But for those important things like setting up different flashes and stuff like that, if you don't hit the OK button, it doesn't save the setting. So I get into the habit of hitting the OK button all the time, because that way there's no problem. All right. Now, new topic, auto ISO. This is one of those fun ones because I used to not like auto ISO at all because it really didn't do anything that I wanted it to do. It would go places I didn't want it to go. It would react against my wishes for shutter speed and exposure, mostly because I didn't understand it. Now, in the past, the options for auto ISO were basically just turning it on and off. That's all you had. And when it was that, I really turned it off the vast majority of the time. What I found worked really well, though, was having it so that for one, to turn it on and off, you now don't have to be in the menu. Now you can hold the ISO button down and turn the front dial, and that'll turn auto ISO on or off. It's just one click in either direction. If it's off, it turns on. If it's on, it turns off. Simple as that. Um, so right away, easier to use now that I don't have to go to the menu to use it. So now if I'm at a wedding and I have auto ISO turned off and I'm shooting the ceremony and I've got the bride and groom up here and I'm very controlled, I've got some time and I'm taking my shots, as soon as they start walking towards me, everything changes. They open the doors, the light in the room changes, then I've got to chase them outside where I'm into a totally different exposure. Now, if I'm doing this in manual, which I'm typically not, I don't have the time. You know what I mean? I'd be chasing the meter all over the place. I normally would be shooting aperture priority, but shooting manual plus auto ISO means you get the aperture and shutter speed combination you want, and an exposure that works pretty much no matter what the light does. Now the way to use this, and I'll get to questions in a moment, the best way to use this I find is that to set the auto ISO minimum shutter speed option to auto. A lot of our cameras have this option now. What that is, is it allows the camera to read the focal length of the lens and make your minimum shutter speed that if you're shooting in program or aperture priority mode. The other thing to do is to go to maximum ISO and make sure that number there represents a number you're okay with. If it isn't, if it's too high, 
if it's a number that you would never normally shoot on your own, then bring it lower. Bring it down to a range that you're happy with. There's no reason to get the perfect shot if it's at a, in a way that you don't like. So if you can make the ISO a little bit lower till it's exactly the maximum you can stand, you know, let's say you don't like the noise at 25,600, but 20,000 is just on this side of passable. Well, shoot the you know maximum ISO at 20,000. Then when you go to auto ISO, you can rely on it. You can you'll know exactly where it's going to go in the worst case scenario. And if it's doing that and you're still underexposing, you need more ISO or less shutter speed and higher aperture. Now, using the full ISO range is important here because I've met people that really have some interesting misgivings on this stuff. One of the weirdest things I heard in a while was a person shooting a D4 back when the D4 was brand new, telling me that they were only shooting it up to ISO 400 because that's what they would do in film. Now, that is not the right way to work with digital. If you do that, it's like, you know, you're only driving a car as fast as a horse-drawn carriage could say travel. You know what I mean? You're really holding yourself back there. So, just to give you an idea of where we're at these days, this is a D4 at 8,000 ISO. Now, this is obviously crops of that shot. Do you see what I'm talking about for noise in here? It's still not horrendous at 8,000 ISO on a camera we came out with a little more than four years ago now. Now, what's amazing about this is most of our cameras now at every price range will do about that well, sometimes better, especially the higher end ones like a D5. D5 puts this to shame, which is remarkable because I'm already very impressed with it. But this is more like what a D5 looks like at 100,000 ISO, not 8,000. Just so you have some idea, by the way. If you don't believe me, we've got D5s. You're welcome to try them out. Now, to actually use this and get a good amount of noise so you don't have too much noise to handle, one of the important things is making sure your exposure is a reasonable one. Now, what I mean by that is that you're not going underexposed at a high ISO, anticipating you can bring it back later. You can and can't, in a sense. As in, you can obviously underexpose now and then in software make a photo brighter. But the problem is that when it does that amplification, it's not doing it in the same place you would if you just change the ISO on your camera inherently. By doing so, if you just underexpose and then uh, use software to fix it later, you typically wind up with more noise, not less. And it really does cause more issues. I'll show you what I mean. This is a D800 at ISO 2000. Yeah, should be 2000 on this one. Now, this is underexposed by two stops, as you can see. That's what happens when I bring it into software and correct for it. So this baseline amount of noise is a lot more noise than a D800 normally produces at 2000 ISO. But the reason I got that was because I underexposed and then brought it back later. Now, that's the way I used to shoot. When it was D70s and D200s and I was working in a lot of really dark places with bands and, and weddings and stuff, I didn't know any better. So I used to underexpose to get that shutter speed I needed at the maximum possible ISO I could handle, and then I would correct for it later. And I, I would have to figure out new ways to do this. I'd have to usually go low saturation, make it look kind of grungy just so the amount of noise that was there would look okay um, but there was no way of really getting that amount of noise out of there unless of course I had learned a bit and done that if I had just done that from the start which is just exposing correctly for the shot it would look fine Do you see the difference I'm talking about between this and that that's the same ISO I did not change ISO here at all. All I changed was exposure. So what happened is the difference between underexposing and bringing it back versus shooting the native normal exposure the camera recommends. Now, you can go the other way. You can go overexposed and actually bring it down a little bit later. That'll also help clear some noise out. Notice how this at the same ISO is still cleaner yet. So what I'm getting at is that don't try to shoot dark and then bring it back. You're more likely to make your shot grainier by doing so. It's better to go into an ISO range you're uncomfortable with than it is to underexpose with the anticipation of fixing it later. You'll typically will get a better shot doing it this way. But also, let's say you're shooting outside on a really bright day, but you have to shoot a high ISO. For me, the example would be if I'm working with a bride and I need to shoot like, you know, F16 to get her eye and something else in focus, the macro lens underneath the veil. I know it's really specific, but get where I'm going with this, I think. Flowers for macro would be another one where you need to be high, a, uh, high aperture, even in bright light. But in doing so, if you were shooting underexposed, you're not going to get that shot as well as you would if you just let the exposure run out at the higher ISO. Now, to make a shot actually look how you want, so far we've covered how do you make it sharper, how do you make it look, you know, not that noisy and make sure it's level and some of those other things. This is one of my all-time favorite settings and I include it in every single class because I really think it's important. If you shoot RAW and JPEG, which is what I shoot, I shoot RAW plus fine JPEG, and you ever compare those two files, this is where you can either have very good nights or very bad ones. Because if you open it with, if you open the RAW file with the wrong software, you're going to see how jarringly different those two shots actually look, even though it's the same shot. Now, this is how I do a lot of my editing, which is to say preemptively. These things, picture controls, are really neat. They're basically you're picking your film stock. So if you want a shot in black and white, put it in black and white. If you want a shot with vivid color, go to vivid. You get the idea. Standard is what it sounds like. Standard is right in the middle. It's, it's really the, what looks natural in a way. Now, 
what's cool about this is you can easily pick these, and in RAW you can change them later. Through the Nikon software, you can change them by name. You can pick standard and it'll look just like standard looks, and, and so on. But you can modify them. If you go, any of our cameras that have this little icon right here, means that you can hit that button and then that menu comes up. Now this is what it looks like in live view, otherwise it's a full menu page. But what's neat about this isn't just that you can change them easily, it's that you can adjust each parameter. As in, you can go into Vivid, for example, and make it different. You can change its brightness, contrast, sharpness. The one that I mostly adjust to be sharpness. On all of our cameras and all of our profiles, what I tend to do is take my sharpness from the two or three that it is by default and bring it up to a five or six, in some rare cases, sevens. Now it depends a little bit on which camera for which number I go with and which profile. It's really personal preference though, is what I'm getting at. All of these settings are going to affect the shot as you take it. They're what become permanent in TIFFs and JPEGs, they become permanent in video, but they're not permanent in RAW. But if you shoot RAW and you shoot everything in RAW, and then you take all of your files and you batch them, and maybe add a little more contrast, a little more saturation, a little more sharpness, do that here and shoot JPEG. You'll have way more space on your card, you'll have the same kind of image quality, and as long as you don't need to then change them, you'll be fine. If you do need to change them, shoot RAW plus find JPEG. You'll have all the things I just said and the file you can edit. That's how I do it and that's why I do it that way. Now, like I said, I bring sharpness up on all of them, partially because what I first noticed is that you can't necessarily tell the difference between a slightly blurry shot, whether it's motion or focus, or and or diffraction at very, very, very minimal neurotic level ranges until you bring the sharpness up here. Even if you just shoot raw and you don't expect this setting to be relevant to your world at all, it will be on the screen of your camera. When you look at the screen, see what you got, these set settings apply to it. So if you have your sharpness turned down or left where it is by default, you won't have the best idea of is your shot perfectly crisp or is it just normally sharp. That's why I change these settings always and would recommend doing so. But to whatever your personal preferences are, I'm one of those weirdos that will shoot portraits with a 36 megapixel camera and harshly lit flash, you know, as sharp as possible. Which so far has worked out, but it's a crazy strategy to take. Most people don't want to know how much detail their skin has in it, and usually it's way more than you'd think. Um, but what I'm getting at is it's important to adjust these to the way you'd want to shoot and the way you would normally edit. Doing so here will produce better image quality. So simply because if you're doing a conversion in other software than Icon software, in RAW, and bring it to JPEG anyway, this will work better here than it will there. Simple as that. But anyway, so sharpening up your picture controls makes a big difference. And also, setting them to be aesthetically what you want makes a big difference here. And the reason is that, you, like all of these shots here, were done in camera with this technique. There's a huge amount of range. In fact, for black and white, for example, you have things like different filter effects you can add. You can add red, yellow, orange, or green. So if you're doing landscape photography and you set it to black and white, set it with a red filter, and now you've got your sky a lot darker if it's a blue sky. You know, there's a lot to be done in these settings that I really recommend exploring. Now, in-camera HDR, this is a neat feature that's a JPEG-only feature. And the reason this comes right after that is because if you are shooting in-camera HDR, the last thing I told you is extremely relevant. Because if you did this in black and white, it stays in black and white. You cannot do an in-camera HDR in our cameras in RAW. So beware of that. Um, if you Basically, if you find that option is grayed out, it's because you're shooting RAW. That's pretty much the only reason I've seen why that grays out. Now, in-camera HDR is pretty neat because what it does is it takes several frames. Oh, Oh, that's right. There we go. Sorry. I had, you know what it was? My, uh, in picture controls, I had an example in here showing you both that for stills and for time lapse or video, this all works the same exact way. Anyway, in in camera HDR, though, the, uh, so that what the camera does is it basically takes a photo based on the highlights and one based on the shadows and combines them into a photo, ideally with all of that range preserved. Now, in my experience, this is a single shot standard picture control off a D610. And as you can see, it looks about how most camera shots would look. You know, you've got a little bit less range than you could see. You can still make stuff out. That's the HDR. That's two frames together in camera all happened automatically when I set it to HDR at a three stop difference. Now what's neat about this is it's not like I just made it brighter because as you can see in the shadows obviously they've opened up but watch the sky. The sky actually goes darker. So that's one of the neat things about it. Uh, the coolest thing about this is it really does work. It's not an artificial effect. It is actually taking separate exposures and combining them to get you a, a single HDR frame that looks a lot better. So it is a worthwhile thing to try. The important thing, though, is that if your subjects are moving, the HDR can be a lot more like a long exposure. You want to treat an HDR shot like it's a long exposure shot, because if anything moves between the two frames, it can not so much blur, but double. You know what I mean? You can get a little bit of ghosting happening there. So you can also set, though, different buttons on your camera for HDR. My favorite, personally, is bracketing. In bracketing, I only ever would bracket for an HDR shot. So to me, as soon as I had the ability to do an HDR in camera, it made sense to set that button for HDR bracketing, or rather for HDR. So you go to the custom settings menu of your camera, the pencil icon, and then down to controls. 
So if you, like I said before, if you want to modify your controls, go to controls. Then you go down, in this case, to assign bracketing button. Not all cameras have this, but a lot of the bigger ones do. And one of the options in there is HDR. Now, you, as you can see, you've got bracketing, multiple exposure, and HDR, all of which can be very interesting. Personally, I use HDR more than I use the other two. So that's why I would set that to HDR. And then all I have to do is hold the button down and turn the dial, and I've got HDR. I can set it for either a single frame, which would be a pair of them, or for a series, where every time I push the button, I'm going to get a pair of frames together as an HDR until I turn the setting off. That's what the series would mean in that case. By the way, just to give you some idea of how this stuff really works out in a long exposure, this is this is where I live. This is Butler, New Jersey. And so this still stays this sharp. Like, if, as long as you set your picture controls upright and you do a little bit of the sharpening there and you set them to be exactly what you want, you don't have a loss of detail because you're shooting JPEG. You don't have it because you're shooting HDR. You'd have it because your settings aren't right or you use the wrong software later on. But in this case, you can see it stays nice and sharp. By the way, I promise, and I'm sorry to say, this is the most interesting thing in the entire photo. I looked at every car, every window, every spot in here that there could be something fun happening, this is the most boring photo I might have ever taken. But it represents HDR reasonably well. But yeah, the fence post and the detail on the brick is the most interesting part of this I can show. <laughs> but anyway, there's the other alternative though, because our cameras have a lot of dynamic range inherently. Dynamic range being how much from light to dark that a camera can see in a single shot. Now our cameras do extremely well with this, fortunately, and it's one of the reasons I like them so much, especially the D810, which currently leads our cameras from what I'm seeing based on reviews I've read, and also just experience. Here's an important thing, though, to notice, which is that let's say that you took a shot like this, and this is being in RAW, and maybe you're at ISO 400. Now, if I were to open up shadows later on in post-production, then I can do that. But think about what that means. Let's say that I've opened these shadows up by three stops down here. Now, notice how the detail level in the grays is already much more muted than the detail level up here, where it's much smoother gradations. I mean, not right now but there. Much smoother gradations in the sky than there are on the plane and on the grass. Now, the reason for this is because we started with very little information, and I didn't add any. I just made it brighter. That's all that bringing brightness up does. It doesn't add information. It just shows you more. Now, if this was at ISO 400, and this is a three-stop difference, then this is like shooting at ISO 3200, but three stops underexposed. Do you see what I mean why that's a bad move? You can do it, and for a Sibdex that move, it's really your only option sometimes to do a single frame HDR, as in to do a single shot in RAW, slightly biased towards underexposure, that you can bring a lot of detail back in. But if you shoot a multiple frame HDR, since each time it's a native exposure, it's not something done in post, it really does turn out a little better from what I've seen. For example, that shot there, as you can see, as soon as I open that up, the, the color gradation in the sky oops, is far smoother than the color gradation down here. And that's what I'm talking about. There's less detail down there because it was that much darker. Now, a shot like this, this was done single frame D800E at the time. Plenty of dynamic range. Usually this stuff can work out beautifully. Same thing with a shot like this. So I'm, I'm just letting you know, you have both options there. If you do shoot for a single HDR frame, make sure you underexpose slightly. It's much easier to get the, the shadows back than it is to get the highlights back. All right, so any questions so far before we jump into Flash? Because Flash is one of my other favorites, of course. So we'll be going into that in a minute. Let me see how we're doing on time. Let's see. All right, we're getting there. Okay, so flash. Now, if you have, who here has a flash for their SLR? Anybody? Okay, who here knows everything about it, uses it all the time? <laughs> all right, then you're in the right place. All right, so here's the, here's one of those things that it's. I, so most of my experience shooting professionally was shooting weddings, and I'm sure all of you that I've met before are tired of hearing me talk about this, but like, I've made so many mistakes doing that, which is why I'm usually able to do these things now and have a reasonably good idea of what can go wrong and how to fix it. Um, one of the things that I didn't know anything about before I started shooting professionally was Flash, and I really didn't want to know anything about it. I never thought Flash would do anything for my life but screw it up, because you see Flash photos all the time, and they suck. They're terrible. It's just that blank, normal, flat, passport-style light, and they're awful. Well, that is obviously is built-in flash. Built-in flash is nobody's friend unless you need it in a minor way. What I mean by that is like I would use the built-in flash the way that people use like the pair of scissors and the Swiss Army knife. Technically scissors, but I'm not going to go to those as my main project scissors. So what I'm getting at though is that flash isn't built-in flash. Flash can be that, but really flash usage is so much more impressive than that. In fact, if you have photographers you really, really, really like, especially people at work studio or you know work with people, and you wonder how do they keep getting that perfect window light or that perfect little bit of light, 
they're bringing it with them. It's either a plug-in light or it's something like our speed lights that run on double A's. And that's, I prefer to go that way. I've never had the money to get studio lights, so I've always gone with speed lights. And I've never regretted it. It's a portable lighting package that's TTL that I can shoot at any shutter speed. And here's how you do that. So FP Sync Setup is how you shoot the flashes at any shutter speed your camera has. You probably know your camera has a main sync speed or maximum sync speed. That might be a, a 1 60th, a 200th, a 250th. If you're still shooting a D100 or a D70, it was a 500th. But you can get way beyond that with modern technology. So here's how you do it. There's two ways to do a shot like this. One is that you shoot a very high shutter speed in a normally lit room with a flash being used. The other is that you shoot a very dark room, long exposure, and you fire the flash manually when you hear the ball bounce. But to get this to happen the first way, where you shoot a high shutter speed, is pretty interesting. All you have to do is you go to Menu, you go to the custom settings menu and just see how well you guys are paying attention. Any guess where I'm going to go to modify something having to do with flash? There we go. Was it because it said the word flash in it? Yes. Was that it? Yeah, that's what got me too. So yeah, you go down to flash. And the very first option for that is flash sync speed. Now, I set this the same way on all of my cameras, and I never change it. Go to the very top option if there's more than one. Go to the very top option just outright. Um, the reason for this auto FP means that the camera, the, the flash will start to strobe when it goes above its native sync speeds. The reason for this is that above those speeds, the shutter's no longer open fully at any one given time. Because of that, otherwise, if you don't set this setting correctly, you'll have a black bar somewhere in your frame where the flash couldn't hit the frame during the exposure. So to get a shot like this, you only really need one flash, you, one flash and a built-in flash to trigger it. Um, but to do so with high speed sync, you need that setting. If this isn't set, you won't be able to go to high shutter speeds. By the way, using your built-in flash, unfortunately you will never be able to go to the craziest shutter speeds your camera offers if the built-in flash is in the shot. That's, that does actually stay with your main sync speed. The flashes I'm referring to would be the bigger ones, the battery powered ones you might add later, SP500, 5000, 700, stuff like that. Now what's really neat about this though is that if you have a Nikon camera with a front command dial and a built-in flash, then you can do this next trick with nothing else. All you need is the remote flash in question. So the next thing to know is that after you've got the camera shooting at any shutter speed you want for flash, now it's about how do you tell other flashes what to do. One of the first tricks I ever learned when I first put a flash on the camera was not to aim it at my subject, to bounce my flashes. Bouncing flashes hugely improves them because you're making the light source way bigger, way softer, and way broader. So I know those things are all kind of the same, but what I'm getting at is that by bouncing flash it gave me a lot of options, but not even as many options as moving my flash off camera gave me, and that's what this is all about. So if you go to menu, and you go to flash control for built-in flash, you can set it to what's called commander mode. Now this is one of those ones that if you don't hit the OK button, it doesn't save. So in this case, the OK button is right here. In your case, it might be right down there if it's a D800 series or the single uh, number series. But here's how this basically works. So the commander mode means the built-in flash tells another flash what to do. That other flash has to be set to remote, and these, there's a couple of things that have to match. You have to make sure the channels match. So in this case, we're on channel one. You need to make sure your remote flash is also set to channel one. And as you see, you have groups A and B that you can control. You need the flash set to either group A or group B and channel one. Once you're set there, everything else happens on the camera, not on the flash. The only thing you'll need to go to the flash for is turning it on and off. So what's neat about this, and I don't even mean while shooting, I just mean over all. What I do personally is I take the built-in flash out of the equation completely. I go down to on that little multi-way dial and knock it out until it's just basically just uh, little dashes. When the built-in flash goes to those little dashes, you still have to have it up and you will still visibly see it fire, but it will not show up in your exposure. The point is that at that point it's not emitting light during the time the shutter is actually open, but the other flashes you're commanding will. So they'll still fire at the right time. This is just getting it out of the shot. There's no reason in my opinion to build up this beautiful series of lights and modifiers and all this cool stuff and then add built-in flash to that. Built-in flash does not generally improve those shots unless you really underexpose it as just a tiny little catch light for the eyes. But anyway, so here's how you get a shot like this. This shot, a single flash, as you can see where the light's coming from, right up top down here, uh, right up top there, aim down and it's using the built-in flash to commander, uh, command it. One of my colleagues, a guy named Paul Van Allen, we've seen several of his shots in this presentation today. He had an assignment one time, which I think was like $25 photo setups. Now, obviously, the camera equipment costs more than $25, unless you can find an amazing used deal off something probably stolen. Um, but what I'm talking about is the rest of it, the sandwich board, the plastic bag, the arm, all that stuff. Uh, and what I used when I recreated this was a dowel, by the way. I didn't need to get an arm with a lock or anything. I just cut two little notches into the uh, presentation board, which comes around, put the dowel on top, clamp the bag to it, poke 
poke a hole in the bag with a thumbtack, and we have the same setup. Oh, don't forget the black paint tray, by the way. And black is relevant here. No reflections back up through it, and also you don't generally see the tray. The cool thing is that, as you can see, the flash is, in this case, down here. But that's what's getting is this. There's no other flashes there. The built-in flash is just telling that flash what to do. And because it's bouncing off the white, it's lighting up that whole area. Now, why is that blue? Does anybody have any idea? Tray is blue. Does it, that's, the tray is blue is the first time I've heard that one. No, I heard the correct answer back there, and it's white balance. So a flash tends to be daylight balance. So it's going to look just about how the sun does at high noon. Not saying to look at the sun at high noon, but just look around, and that's the kind of light you'll get out of a flash. What this is is tungsten balance, meaning that the, if you're correcting for the very orange screw and light bulbs that are considered tungsten light bulbs, you need to add this much blue before it looked normal and gray again. But because we're using daylight balance, adding all that blue without all that orange to counter it gives is a blue shot. You can use white balance as essentially a series of color filters. And you can even do custom set uh, filters that way. Like what I used to do is go to whatever you know hardware store there was, pick up a couple of paint swatches that I thought would be interesting, knowing that you get exactly the opposite color out of the paint swatch you're holding. And then you do a custom preset white balance off that paint swatch. And then let's say you do one off of a uh, you know an orange, you'll get a purple. If you do off a green, you'll get a red. That kind of thing. It's a really neat way to set custom filters essentially. Um, but the way you would do it is you go to white balance, you go over to pre, let go of white balance and hold it down again for about two seconds. When pre starts to flash, fill the frame with a color that should be really neutral gray to set the accurate white balance, and then take a picture. If it says no GD, that's no good and you got to do it again, probably the wrong exposure. If it says good, then it's ready to shoot. Take pictures, it'll look pretty neat. By the way, the way to accurately do this is to use an 18% gray card. That way you have a neutral target and you're telling the camera this is neutral, and that's when you do the preset white balance. But anyway, so back to flash. Using tungsten white balance here, we shifted the whole thing to blue. So here's how you set up the commander in one of my favorite ways. So going into built-in flash and into commander mode as we walk our way down there. There we go. So like I was saying before, you can take the built-in flash and actually dial it out of the exposure by doing that. Once it's in that, in that configuration, it still has to be up, it still will visibly fire, but it will not show up in the shot. Now, I caution you on this one thing, as in, if you set it this way, don't forget to hit OK, otherwise it won't save, but if you set it this way, and then you go to use the built-in flash as a flash, think about what's going to happen. You're going to pop the flash up, it's going to fire, and nothing will have, but whatever you get back will be black. It won't look like the flash showed up at all. So you'll see it fire, your subjects will see it fire, but the flash won't be in the shot. It's because you're still in commander mode in this configuration. So in case you use your built-in flash as a flash on occasion, remember if you've ever set it to this, that's probably what's going on. Also, it sounds very slightly different when it does this because it fires multiple times. So if you're wondering why does my flash sound weird, it's probably in commander mode. It's not a problem, by the way, it's just a good thing to know about. I've had people worried that their flash was shorting or something like that at trade shows. Listen to this thing. And I look at it, and I go to their menu, and sure enough, it's in commander mode. So just a good thing to know. By the way, the way that you change your balance on these things, I personally shoot flash and TTL pretty much all the time. Um, the rare times that I don't would be for focus stacks because in that case I need the flash to be exactly the same every single shot for a whole long series of shots regardless of where I'm focused. But generally I shoot TTL and the way that I get any control over TTL is that. When you shoot TTL flash you can be anywhere from full auto to full manual it doesn't matter. TTL means the flashes are metering for themselves they'll figure it out. They're using the, well they're relative they're actually using the camera's meter in order to figure this out. But the neat thing is that let's say you've got this is your set Subject. The TV is one big light, this is my other light. I could have it as zeroed out like it is there and I get even lighting on this subject. If I move the subject over here, I still get even lighting. If I move it over here, I still get even lighting. Because in TTL it's adjusting every single time to give me what I'm asking for. Now if it's manual and I'm even, even ratios, it'll be fine here but too bright on this side over here, too bright on this side over here. See what I mean for why I like TTL? My subject can move in between these lights and my balance stays exactly at what I told it uh, to be. Now if I were to set this though to something like plus three, plus one, or the minus range. You know, you can bring these up or down. What you're able to then do is, let's say you want this set to plus one. Let's, here's an easy way, by the way. Always go A, B, and C for your lights. That way you'll always know which one you're adjusting. So if you always start with A's on your left, B's either on the right or in the middle, and C's all the way to the right of that, you'll be fine. Um, but setting it this way, let's say that from your perspective, this would be A. So this side is a stop brighter, still a stop brighter, still a stop brighter. Doesn't matter where I move this until I exceed the range of the light. So, moving on, you get the idea. I can adjust this stuff pretty endlessly and, and play with the two different groups here. Now, I can also set one group to manual, one to TTL, but I generally don't. I generally shoot both in TTL and I dial in what lighting ratio I want, and that's how I get it. 
By the way, if there are multiple photographers in the room, it's good to know to change your channel. As in, if you shoot the same channel as another Nikon photographer, you're going to be shooting their flashes too, and they'll be shooting yours. Now, this could be an advantage if you've already worked with that photographer, you both understand about how flashes work, and you know how to stagger your shots pretty effectively. Helps when you've been shooting with somebody for a long time to be able to do that well. Um, but if you don't, then it's very wise to not have your flashes interfere with theirs and vice versa. Doing so by uh, going to a different channel will take care of that problem completely. But it is one of those neat things, by the way, actually something I should point out, is that let's say you are in the same channel as another photographer in the room. That guy Seth that you saw, somebody I used to shoot weddings with all the time. Now, what he and I would do is between us, we had about six flashes and at, at the time. And so I could set up a ratio that was completely different than his. I could make A plus three and minus whatever uh, for B. You know what I mean? I can make it whatever numbers I want. He can make his whatever other numbers he wants. Whenever I shoot, all the flashes that are all being used now do exactly what I tell them to do. When he shoots, they do something totally different. They do what he tells them to do. So by having two photographers shooting TTL with this sort of system, each photographer still gets exactly what they want, but they will never get it at exactly the same time because if one of them, if they fire at the same time, one of them gets the shot, one of them doesn't. Simple as that. So you've got to be careful and you want to stagger your shots. Also, I've had a number of teachers, uh, photo teachers, come to me with burnt out flashes. Now, to burn a flash takes a lot of abuse. I can't really overstate how much effort that takes, but what it would be is they had a, a flash hooked up to a battery pack and they had a class of like 20 people all with commander flashes all in the same channel all testing that flash out you can bet that flash fired all the time and what happens if it's firing at full power all the time eventually it can overheat there's in the manual there's a rating for how many times a flash can fire before it overheats and they way exceeded that rating and even when you do, sometimes they're okay, but not in that case. But anyway, point being, you can adjust all the stuff from the, from the camera itself, so you never have to walk over to your flash to do anything but aim it slightly differently or put a modifier on it. And like I said, all this stuff was just a single flash, very easy to do. Now, here's where we get into kind of a cool nested trick, because you just saw how to do commander flash from the built-in flash. Now I'm going to show you how to set this up so that menu comes up in one button. If you don't, you go menu, custom settings menu, uh, flash, and then down to, I think, uh, what is it, F3, um, uh, flash setting, uh, built-in flash uh, setting. This gets you there in one button. So here's what you do. You go menu, and down at the very bottom tab, if you notice all the way down there on the left, is now my menu. Now, if you go down to there and you don't see something that says my menu, you likely will see something that says recent settings. If you go to the very bottom of that menu there, you'll have a thing that says choose tab, where you can switch between my menu and recent settings. Now, recent settings, I think, is somewhat self-explanatory. It's all the settings you've recently changed, which is useful in its own way. My menu, though, is pretty cool because it's a menu you make. So you get to put in there whatever you want and in whatever order. Now, this is where this gets really interesting because if you do this, you have an option for controls that can be really fun and applied to a broad range of things. You can customize uh, the function and preview buttons on your camera to recall almost anything in the camera. But for those things you can't recall, this is how you do it. So go to my menu, and what you want to do is you want to add an option to the very top here. So what we're going to do is basically go to add items on the very bottom, you see what I mean about that choose tab, by the way, back here? Oops, it's going to go back one. That choose tab is what I was talking about between recent settings and my menu. So you go to add items, and in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to add that commander mode trick. So I'm going to go down to custom settings, and then down to flash. Oh, that's right, it was E3, not E, yeah. And then flash control for built in, and then down to commander mode, and then guess what button you have to hit for this to work? It's the OK button. Yep, thanks for playing at home. <laughs> so anyway, now that you see that that's the top item in my menu, right? You see how that's now the top thing up there? So here's what's so cool about this. Remember that wording, top item in my menu, because now I'm going to show you how to bring that up with a single button. What you do is you go down to Custom Settings and Controls. There we go. i got to update the, the speeds at which this thing actually moves on me. So anyway, you go down to Controls, in this case, Assign Function button. And one of my all-time favorite things is access top item in my menu. Very simply, once you select that and, of course, hit OK, then basically when you hit this button, that menu comes up. And you can do that for almost everything. Anything in the menu, you can have as a top item in my menu. And you can assign anything that it's a top item in my menu to a function or preview button. And that's how you do it. All right, well, thanks for coming, everybody. I appreciate your time and attention. Hope you have a good time and safe travels out there and whatever apocalyptic snowscape that probably is outside. Yeah.
Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.